and welcome everyone. In this podcast, we're going to talk about sex influence and sex limited traits, environmental factors, and discontinuous versus continuous traits. And in the last podcast, we'll focus on gene interactions. All right, let's talk first about sex influenced traits. A good definition of this is when a specific allele is dominant in one gender and recessive in the other gender. A good example of this is seen with cattle and the structure on cattle called a skur. Skurs are just these horn-like structures on their heads in the same position where you might see antlers on a deer. But it displays a sex-influenced trait. The presence or absence of skurs is determined by this gene. SC plus is the wild type version and then SC minus is the mutant version. So over here let's write some genotypes. SC plus, SC plus, SC minus, and SC minus and then the heterozygote, SC plus, SC minus. And here we'll put male cows, or, and then over here we'll have female cattle. SC plus, SC plus, in males or females, you'll see skurs. SC minus, SC minus, the homozygous recessive, no skurs. So, as far as the homozygous states, dominant or recessive, there's no difference in gender. Either spurs, skurs, or no skurs. However, in the heterozygote, we see a difference. Just like we've seen a difference in the heterozygote with the other, some, of, some of the other extensions to Mendel's rules. The male, who is heterozygote, has skurs. The female, no skurs. So, in this trait, sex influence trait, the heterozygote is the thing to look at. If in the heterozygote you see a difference in phenotype between males and females, we call it a sex influence trait. We can see it in both sexes because we see it in males and females, but the heterozygote change. So the gender does influence whether this trait is expressed. Okay, now let's talk about sex limited traits. In sex limited traits, these would be traits found only in one sex. There are several examples of this. Some are rather obvious and some are less obvious. So let's just talk about a couple examples. One example would be preeclampsia. Or other pregnancy related syndromes like so since these are pregnancy related syndromes, only females have these traits. Sex limited. Only found in females. Lactation is generally thought of as a sex limited trait. There is a male limited precocious puberty. which means that these males go through puberty at a much younger age. Usually if it's this state here, the precocious state, it's by the year, by nine years of age, where they'll start having facial growth, the voice changes, and all the other things that accompany puberty. The last thing is hen feathering. So let's talk about hen feathering because that offers a nice example for us. Whereas in the homozygous dominant and the heterozygote, we get hen feathering. And in the homozygous recessive, you get that male pattern. They have a longer comb on their head. Their tail feathers are spread out a little bit more. So it's a sex limited trait. As the homozygous recessive in males, they have this male pattern of feathering. All right, now I want to talk about environmental factors.
this could be any number of environmental factors that influence a trait and they can be linked to some of the other things we've talked about. If you remember we talked about lethal alleles, we said if you have a mutation in that glycolytic enzyme, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, that usually you're fine, but if you eat fava beans it can be lethal. So that would be an example of an environmental factor that leads to lethality. So we'll write that as an example. There's a lots of examples that we see related to temperature. So let's spend a little time talking about that. And we've talked about this before when we talked about conditional alleles or temperature sensitive alleles. When we talked about the fly that at one temperature, the same mutation, but at one temperature there would be no wings. So let's just draw this table real quick. So temperature along the vertical the horizontal axis and along the vertical axis is wing size. And we know at lower temperatures there's no wing and as the temperature increases we begin to have wings. So this is an environmental factor. The temperature affects whether or not that, that protein will function properly. Usually in the case of environmental factors it, it comes down to how that protein folds and how it acts. At one temperature or one environmental state that protein will fold a certain way and it will have a certain activity. At a different temperature or a different environmental factor that protein will fold a different way and will have a different activity. And some examples of this temperature effect we can see with Siamese cats. Siamese cats are white for the most part across their body except their head, their ears, and their limbs are darker. Same is true with a Himalayan rabbit. a white body but their ears and their nose is dark. So how does this happen? And you should prepare yourself for another beautiful picture. Let's draw a rabbit because clearly I can draw rabbits better. In this rabbit it's white for the most part all over except the ears are darker, its nose is darker, its limbs are darker like so. And that's because the gene, remember same gene in the cells that produce pigments in the white areas and in the darker areas. However, in these areas and the expressed protein folds differently and the activity is different. Again, every one of the pigment producing cells in this body of this rabbit has the same gene for pigmentation and it expresses the same gene. When that gene is expressed and it makes the protein in the extremities because the temperature is a little higher in these extremities that protein will fold differently and because it folds differently it's going to have a different activity and in this case it produces a darker pigmentation in these areas. Now why does it do this? Why not just make a completely darker pigmented rabbit? or why not just an all white rabbit? Well it turns out that in these extremities they're going to lose heat faster so it's better to have darker pigmentation there where they're going to be able to absorb more heat. And you don't want to be a completely dark rabbit if you're living in the white snow because then you become a pretty easy target for a predator. So this is a nice balance. They're able to physiologically conserve their heat and avoid predators. The last thing I want to talk about in this podcast are discontinuous and continuous traits. And for this I want to show you a picture and so I'm going to move to my computer and talk about that. Okay, I'd like to talk now about the difference between a continuous phenotype and a discontinuous phenotype. Most of the phenotypes that we've talked about before are discontinuous, like the blood types. You're either A, you're B, you're AB, or you're O. There's no in-between. You can't be A and a half or B and three quarters. You either are or you aren't. Many phenotypes, perhaps most phenotypes, are continuous in their nature. And height is a perfect example. And height is a perfect example. This picture is taken from a class picture from some prep school out east. I don't know the name of the school. And it was taken at the early part of the 1900s. And this is the range of their heights. 
from 4.5 to 5.9 and you can see that the average height was between 5 5.2 in that range. They then took the picture again in the early 2000s and you can see that you still have a, a range but the average height is between 5.6 and 6. The previous picture I showed you was just males because females weren't allowed at that school at that time. And so if you only look at the males here shown in blue shirts, you can see that the average height is even higher, around 5'10". So both of these are examples of a continuous phenotype. You don't have just two phenotypes, short and tall. You have a range of heights. So we call it a continuous phenotype. And so height is a really good example for this because many things can affect the height of an individual. There are genes involved, in fact many genes involved, so we would call it polygenic because of that. We also know that the environment plays a key role. So the difference between the early 1900s and the early 2000s is huge. Between then and now we have a better access to food, we have a better knowledge of nutrition, we have a more diverse population. All of these likely play a role into why over a course of a hundred years or so um, the average height of individuals got taller. So both genes and the environment play a role. So again, this is a good example of a multifactorial trait. All right, let's go back to the whiteboard. All right, well, that's all we're going to have for this podcast. In this podcast, we talked about sex influence and sex limited traits. We talked about environmental factors. And we talked about discontinuous and continuous traits. In our final podcast of this section on extensions to Mendel's rules, we're going to talk about gene interactions, and in particular, epistasis.